The speakers that we have this morning have all been studying the future of life, and they may be looking at it from different perspectives, so from the past to the present, and also from small and large perspectives. Their approaches may vary from decoding small cellular components to investigating the population history of extinct species to analyzing genomic data from our earliest ancestors. But each of these speakers has contributed to a better understanding of the world around and within us. And today, they will all focus on what the future holds for their respective fields. The first of these speakers, Ada Yonath, has dedicated her career to understanding the complex architecture of ribosomes. In 2009, Yonath received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for studies of the structure and function of the ribosome. Driven by the desire to understand how the genetic code is translated into proteins, Yonath has developed pioneering technologies in crystallography. Her insights have also led to a better understanding of the mechanisms of drug resistance and have paved the way for structure-based drug design. Yonath is currently the director of the Martin S. and Helen Kimmel Center for Biomolecular Structure and Assembly at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. Today, she's going to tell us about the future of structural biology. Please welcome Ada Yonath. Just one announcement, they've dimmed the house lights, so just be aware that it's a little bit dimmer in here for this speaker. Good morning. I actually want to talk about the future of structural biology, not only molecular biology, as, as was suggested earlier, because I'll, in, in a minute I'll show how they are connected. And also, I want to talk about a specific aspect of origin of life, all somehow strongly related to Schrodinger. So just for the students, molecular biology is a branch of biology that concerns the molecular basis of biological activities of biomolecules that are essential to life including their specific functions, their various interactions, their biosynthesis, and the regulation of their interactions. But in nature, structure means function. It means when we talk about function, we must know the structure, because they are highly correlated. And I'm using here a very sophisticated machine that I'm sure you all know, paper clips. You see, the paper clips can do what they need to do, what they are meant to do, to put together, to keep together several pages. When we change only their structure, not their composition, not their length, not their anything, just the structure, it's exactly the same material. If it was made of many components, it would be the same order of components, but they cannot do the job unless they have the right function. And this is the way that I see structural biology. It's, it's the, the decider of the function. So in, in the cells, I'm sure you all know that the instru instructions for how proteins are being made are in the DNA, in the genes, proteins are made of amino acids, and each amino acid is being coded here in the gene. The, all the genes have only four letters, and each combination of three of them can code for an, an amino acid or termination in instructions and so on. They first being transcribed to a similar molecule called RNA, because here the information is hidden, they, the code is hidden. Here the code becomes exposed and can be translated to growing proteins by ribosomes. This was all known when I started my studies. The only thing that was not known and people really wanted to understand is how the ribosome does this. How, how the, does this happen? 
So the main function of ribosomes are decoding and peptide bond formation. Peptide bonds are the bonds between the amino acids. The ribosomes are universal. The way that they are being performed is the same, almost fully the same, but very, very highly conserved in all cells, regardless of the, of the source. So it's in bacteria and in fish and in trees and in lions and human beings. There is a huge number of ribosomes that function in each living cell. Some mammalian cells, like liver, may contain millions of ribosomes, four or five millions. Even bacterial cells contain up to 100,000 ribosomes. In vivo, within the cells, the ribosomes act continuously. They can form up to 40 bonds, bonds between the amino acids, which are the components of the proteins, in one second, and they hardly make mistake. And I, can I tell you something about myself? I was the fastest student in my class, not because I was so fast and so good, but because I was very poor and I had a million jobs, and I had to finish the lab fast, 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 and go and do my, my duties. So I had to make, when I was a second year student, a single peptide bond, one. The fastest, six hours. And they can make 40 in a second, up to 40. They work like, a, now that we know how they work, they lay, work like factories with two floors. The code is being recorded here, decoded here. And trucks, which are also RNA molecules, transfer RNA, bring the amino acids that will be connected to the new growing protein, the newly growing protein in the lower flow. So when there is here a triplet that codes for that amino acid, it will come in and be connected and the protein will come out from there and the truck will be empty and also go out from the first flow. Actually, the two flows are representing the two ribosomal subunits. Each ribosome is made of two subunits, a small one, a large one. They come together only when they have to do the work when the cell tells them. So when we got the structures, right away, we, we, thought, we, we got the structures of the two subunits, we thought that we understand how ribosomes work, bacterial ribosomes. We got together with two students of the Art Academy in Jerusalem, and we made this little clip. Uh, the colors here are not the best, but what you see is, is the best they, they could do in this room. You can find the, the, the movies in YouTube. So here is the messenger reaching the small subunit. The small subunit is waiting. An initiation factor is stuck to it. You will see it in a minute, the blue thing. In, they are in bacteria three initiation factors. Number three is now stuck. And it will allow the continuation of the translation. So here it comes, and here is the here you can see the blue, the initiation factor, and the messenger is now sitting in place, everything is fine. The first track, the first tRNA can be brought by another factor, another initiation factor, this light blue, it's initiation factor two. Now, when the first tRNA is being caught, is being in place, the large subunit can come, interact with the small one, even by conformational changes, making bridges, and the ribosome is ready to work. And look how it works. Elongation factors are bringing the, the tRNAs. Ribosome helps in, out, in, out, 40 times a second. And the peptide bond is being made in the small subunit. And the, uh, sorry, the coding is in the small subunit and peptide bond in the large. We took away the large subunit now, so you can see how peptide bond is being made up there, and the bond, so hydrodecoding is up there, and the bond is, make, is being made down, and the new, newly born protein goes out through a tunnel that spans the large subunit. When the process is over, when the code is, is over, there is a set of, of uh, factors, like this uh, uh, gold thing that comes there, Recycling factors, release factors, they come in, they release the two subunits, and 
All the factors, including the newly born protein, this blue thing down there, can go and do their job. That's all. Isn't it simple? <laughs> it took us only 20 years. So what you saw in the movie, essentially, in this clip, is the small subunit, the large subunit, two tRNAs that are busy in making the bond, the decoding in the small subunit, the bond in the large subunit in PTC, peptidyl transferase center, and an exiting one. So actually there are three sites for tRNA, and just to remind those that forget what is tRNA, it's a molecule that looks almost the same in every, every cell. It has an anti-codon loop here that reads the code, and a free prime end, which is always CCA and amino acid, that is cognate to the loop is bound here. All tRNAs in all, in all uh, living cells. In the movie, you didn't see details, but actually we know the position of each and every atom. This was in 2000. Now many more structures are being available. I can talk about it later. But you can see here the small subunit, which sediments is 30 years rotating. It's made mainly of ribosomal RNA, and many proteins, these little colorful things, I hope you can see. And uh, if you want some, some uh, uh, chemistry, it's written here. Small subunit for decoding, large subunit for making the peptide bond, and you can see here it's rotating. It's much larger. It's a one and a half megadalton in molecular weight. Again, it's made mainly of RNA. Because of the fundamental role played by the ribosomes, many antibiotics target them. If, if we want to get rid of a pathogenic bacteria, bacteria that cause diseases, stopping protein biosynthesis, next generation and the generation after will somehow disappear, isn't it? If there will, there will not be proteins. So almost half of the clinically useful antibiotics target protein biosynthesis mostly by paralyzing the ribosomes. Did you know that the natural antibiotics are the weapons that bacteria from one type is using for interfering with cell life of different microorganisms? If you don't know, you didn't know, you know now. <laughs> the question is, how do these tiny antibiotics, which very, very complex chemistry that this this bacteria know to make, how do they paralyze the giant ribosome? So just here are some numbers. The bacterial ribosomes are of two and a half million Daltons, and antibiotics are less than a thousand. The trick it, each antibiotic is binding to a specific, a specific site, functional site, and like in a, in a factory, if one, if one function is not, it's not made, Nothing else does. So you can see here, some bind it to the small subunit in the decoding, in the hinging, and in the large subunit to the tunnel or to the bonding. So we made another little movie. You know, when I, when I started, I, I didn't even dream that I will see the ribosome. But to see the antibiotics in it, this was beyond my dreams. But now you can see. This is adenine. Look how small it is, but it goes to a very important place. It's just a barrier for the messenger RNA. Let's look at the next one, tetracycline, which is more useful in, uh, in clinical uh, treatment, and it occupies the position of the second site, A site tRNA, it's called. The first one is P and the second is A, just occupies its position. One tRNA is not sufficient for a peptide bond. Now let's look at two more, erythromycin, which was the first a, antibiotic that target ribosomes after penicillin. It sits in the tunnel where protein comes out, and only a very short protein can be made, five to seven amino acids. And the last one is the cleverest chemically. It goes into the bond, clindamycin, look at it into the bond. Chup, chup, chup. Here. Isn't it clever? 
So antibiotics are great, but there are problems with them, and I won't talk about all problems, just one of them, resistance to antibiotics, which is also a natural process. The resistance is done by the, the, the bacteria by themselves. Is the most severe problem in modern medicine, and this was this is, was created even before antibiotics went into clinical use. Because it's so bad, the World Health Organization announced that we are reaching a post-antibiotic era. And the World Bank estimated that up to 3.8, almost 4% of the global economy will be lost by 2050 because of resistance. Yet, very few new antibiotics are in development by the most large companies. It's not a, I don't want to go into it, but there is a big mismatch because what we need in order to keep living and the profit making. And the expenses are really very high and I just want to show you real quick. This is the way the resistance to three different bacteria grew in the last 20 years and this is the amount of new antibiotics. My own opinion, can we, resist, can we combat resistance to antibiotic fully? I think it's unlikely. Because bacteria want to live and because they are cleverer than us. At least they are cleverer in terms of uh, survival. So in order to think about new bacteria, we had to think about beating beating the bacterial wisdom. And this is what we are trying to do in our lab today. So the concept is, although pathogenicity is usually not located on ribosomes, we aim at exploiting unique, unique structural features of the ribosomes that are involved in peripheral ribosomal interactions for, and using them for res reducing resistance antibiotics. And I want to show it. And for this, you need to wait a second. So what you see here rotating is the skeleton of the large subunit of a non-pathogenic non bacteria, harmless bacteria in, in uh, gray, and pieces that are additional in cyan. The, the statistics people told, told me it won't work. You won't see anything. It's less than 10%. But uh, less than 10%, if it's located, it's very good. And let's focus on this for a second. This is the way it looks. Most of the, of the structure is the same, but here, this is the additional part. It's on the periphery. It's not near the main functional sites. And it can be a potential binding site. Oops, sorry. We suggest this to become a potential binding site. So in a model system, we identified 25 new potential sites. We blocked all of them, and 16 of them really led to stopping protein biosynthesis. And these sites are not involved in the primary ribosomal activity, as I said a minute ago, not in decoding or peptide bond formation. Hence, no pathogen contains genes for their modification. This means that so far, no bacteria assigned vital roles to these sites. Therefore, for now, these sites can be exploited for the design of advanced degradable antibiotics and environmental friendly. I can't talk about all of them, but we are doing this. But this is not all. Careful analysis, not only uh, antibiotics, careful analysis of ribosomes, of the ribosome structure, led us to investigate a key stage in origin of life. And I think this belongs somehow to Schrodinger. So you remember, this is a small subunit, large subunit decoding and peptide bond formation. You also plus remem surely remember the tRNA molecule with the anticodon loop and the fully conserved free prime end. And this is the part that binds to the PTC where protein is being made. The, the fully conserved free prime end. So in this picture, what is here in the PTC are the edges of the tRNA. When we look how the tRNA binds to the small and to the large subunit, we see that the decoding and peptide bond formation are in RNA. 
environment, protein free, just RNA. So the ribosome is actually a ribozyme, namely an RNA machine. And what does it mean? So kids sometimes tell me that the cell does not trust one kingdom to make another one. And I think they are right. I think that this is sophisticated regulatory machinery. It is a, this part of the RNA is fully conserved even in mitochondria where part of the ribosome has been, part of the RNA has been replaced by proteins. And it is also in good, good agreement with the idea that there was an RNA dominated prebiotic world. And also it shows that nature can make from RNA that are usually insufficient enzy inefficient enzymes can make from it this very efficient ribosome. So let me just show some of our thoughts. We look now at the PTC. This is the tRNA, CCA amino acid. And we see that the ribosome positions the two, the two tRNA in a proper semi-symmetrical, you see here, semi-symmetrical orientation. Stereochemistry for making peptide bond here. And the ribosome here is in, in gray. A site tRNA is in blue and P in green, and I'll keep these colors later. So when we look at semi-symmetric or symmetric piece of the RNA in the ribosome, and we look at the map of the RNA of the ribosome, we see no symmetry. Yet, when we look at the structure, not at the sequence, not at the way that uh, we draw the, the, uh, the map of the RNA, we see that this part has a semi-symmetrical rotation axis here. And this part, I'll show you in detail, this part is where the P-site tRNA is, and this is the A-site. This is actually the active site of the ribosome here. So the active site of the ribosome has a semi-symmetric structure. When we look at it from top, and we draw, I, what I did here, I drew the, the PTC of eubacteria, archaea, eukaryotes, my, mitochondria, everything, one on top of the other, here are the details. I couldn't distinguish between them. All this blue and all this green are the same, the two parts. This is this part. When we draw it from the side, it looks like this, and here there are also the CCA amino acid, it means the parts of the tRNA that are busy in making the peptide bond. The conservation of this region is very high. It's the highest in all, in all uh, pieces of ribosomes, and we looked at 980 sequences. It's almost 100 in most of the, of, of the um, nucleotides, but it's never less than 50%. It's very, very high. So the high conservation of the symmetrical region indicates that its existence is beyond environmental conditions. And we propose that this is the proto-ribosome. If environmental and uh, evolutionary conditions did not change it, it was before the ribosome, the proto-ribosome. So it means that the prebiotic bonding entity named by us the proto-ribosome is still functioning in the contemporary ribosome. And this is its size. You see, the, the whole large subunit is rotating, and the size of the, of, of the proto-ribosome is here, this little greenish, that looks like this with the ends of two tRNAs in two different, in two different ways, as I saw before. So if we look at the whole ribosome, this sits here, this blue, blue green. You can see here in more details, it connected the small subunit to the large subunit. It looks from top this way and from the side this way. And this is what we call the proto-ribosome. Based on the suggestion existence of an RNA-dominated world and on the finding that RNA can replicate and elongate itself and has catalytic activity, we propose that this piece is not only the proto-ribosome, proto it is the entity around which life has evolved. And in order to, to prove it more than just looking, we try to construct proto-ribosome in the lab, and I'm showing you now you, uh, I'm telling now you, uh, you now about more than nine years of trials and so on. 
And one of our hypotheses, we tried many things, but one of our hypotheses suggested that the catalytic proto-ribosome is a product, product of demerization. It requires the existence of self-replicating, self-folding, and self-dimerizing dimer, RNA molecules. This is what it requires. Self, the, the existence of RNA, self-folding, self-dimerizing, and the, the creation of a catalytic pocket. So we tried to make it using this part, as I showed you earlier. We had this part from the P side and from the A side. And we, 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 did, we, we took different cutoffs here, and we saw that only part of them dimerized, only those that came from the P site. We didn't get PNA, and we didn't get A alone. We also made pieces of RNA that we thought this is the sequence, that we thought should fold the way we want, and also this, only half of them dimerized. So actually, we discovered a non-uniform tendency to dimerize, and we think that what we see is pre-Darwinian Darwin, Darwinism. Darwin talked about uh, organisms, we see it in molecules. To cut a long story short, we tried also to get the peptide bond by these dimers that we got. And just to remind you, this is peptide bond formation, and the way that uh, the biologists try to show that ribosomes are active or not active, they had this particular uh, substrate. So I, won't do, I won't go into detail. This, the, uh, the reaction is one plus the other, makes the two of them. And in February this year, it's the first time after almost 10 years, more than nine years, that we got the, 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 the peptide a peptide bond formation by the proto-ribosome. And if, if you want to see some, uh, some detail, 67 times two amino, uh, nucleotides, MALDI was the, the um, method to detect the dipeptide. We, we did positive and negative uh, controls, and it took less than one second. So what now? Now that we think that we know that we have the proto-ribosome, as we prove the existence of it, or what could have been the, the prebiotic apparatus for peptide bond formation, we can try to investigate or suggest the following evolution steps. I cannot talk to you about all, just the emergence, in our opinion, the emergence of the genetic code, so initial d-peptide could become a tripeptide and a fourth peptide in the same in the same machinery. And the existence of well-performing oligopeptides that are catalyzing fundamental reactions or stabilizing the machine that makes them could, could lead to some type of code, of maybe, maybe primitive code. So I just want to show what are needed or, or useful proteins. So if this is a small oligopeptide with histidines, it can carry metals which were needed in the, in the RNA world. Also, if this is a machine that we looked at it earlier, it can be stabilized in several positions here and there. And this is based on what we see in, in a, the cell, in, in, in the ribosomes. It's based on, on the way that the, what we call proto-ribosome is within the ribosome. So uh, they, could, they could stabilize it. So this means that the genetic code was created by, or according to its products, which have been found to fit, to be fit and useful. Therefore, they survived. And they led to the creation of a primitive original genetic code, which co-evolved together with its product. I want to repeat it. The genetic code co-evolved together with its products. So in summary, our hypothesis is based on the existence of self-replicating RNA molecules and on the assumption that the genetic code followed its, its products. And just to remind, remind you, we talk about this blue-green. How does it relate to Schrödinger? Schrödinger's book is having on its, uh, on its uh, first page or cover the chicken or the egg Problem. 
What was first, the chicken or the egg? In our world, what was first, the genetic code or the proteins? You know what is our answer? The proto-ribosome was the first. <laughs> A few words about the, the pink future, after we talked about this, the fu pink future of structural biology and sophistic molecular biology uh, is, is now flourishing owing to the revolution in, of cryo-electron microscopy that can replace for many systems, not all systems, crystallography, so we don't need crystals and we don't need the, this time of growing them and looking at them. And for antibiotics designed, which is within this pink future, many more structures are needed if we want to talk about pathogen a specific antibiotic. This is our thinking. We need, we need this because it, we will be able to reduce resistance. So in, just to show you that for ribosomes, the cryo-electron microscopy is fantastic. Here is, is the, the distribution of Leishmania, which is a parasite brought by sand flies. And we found a not we, but a group in Israel that collaborate with us uh, found a new, a, a new a, a medicine for it, a new, a new inhibitor, a new antibiotic. We had to show it, so we, or we wanted to show it. So within a few months, we got the structure of its large subunit, the proteins, the RNA. I want to show you the quality. Here are all the proteins. I just focus on one of them. You can see how high they the uh, detail that we can see, we also can see that the RNA, purines and pyrimidines, we can show them this way or that way. We can even see magnesium ions. We can even see uh, modifications, this type or this type. Actually, we identified 99 RNA modifications that were not even in the literature. We, I, I can also show you even higher resolution this is, this is a comparison between two structures of a, the, the ribosome of linezolide complexes. Linezolide is one of the antibiotics. One is resistance. And you see this is the wild type in red and the resistance in green. And just a little change here in a protein far away from the binding site, the binding site is here in yellow, changed the position of one of the nucleotides from here to here. So, sorry, from here to here, and it became resistant. So there is really pink future, and I think that in this point I want to thank the um, people that allowed me to work in, on this project for a long time. The person that made the decision at the Weizmann Institute didn't kick me out was, yeah, I was almost one leg out already, was, Professor Michael Seller, who was a biologist, and everybody said, yeah, he let Ada stay because he's a biologist. But when his term was over and he was replaced by a high, high uh, energy physicist, he also didn't kick me out. And this is because they were uh, encouraged by the Scientific Advisory Committee. I'm sure you know the name Kendrew, that the structure of the first, uh, first protein, myoglobin, and Anfin said they showed the structure is needed for function, and it's determined by the sequence of the amino acid. Uh, they were both Nobel Prize winners. But I also want to thank twice as much to Alex Rich, who tried for 10 years to crystallize ribosomes and failed, and yet was very supportive. It all started with a strong collaboration, very fruitful collaboration with the Max Planck in, in Berlin, Max Planck for Molecular Genetics, with their director that all what he wanted to know is everything about ribosomes. He, he was a very, very important in starting a group for us at the synchrotron, the DAISY, where we measured. But he died 10 years before the structures came out, and he was replaced first by Franceschi and then by Fuccini. So I had two groups. The group that I had in Hamburg was terminated 14 years ago but they were working very hard and very good, and I want to thank them and my group in Israel that was running all the time for their devotion and determination in good 
probably more, more in bad times for many years. And I also want to, to, to show you the people in my, uh, the group in Israel during the last 10 years. Not all of them are with us, with us today, especially for the young students here, the high school and the young students. The group is run by Dr. Anat Basham, a female scientist, fantastic scientist, and fantastic mother for three children. I'm here only as an ornament. <laughs> I don't want to go one by one. I don't have time for that, but I want to show you Tamar. Tamar is also a female. She came 16 years ago for 10 weeks. She's still around. <laughs> and the day that I took the picture, she had birthday, and she baked a cake. Girls, female scientists know to bake. Look at her cake, you can see? <laughs> you can see her cake? I want to show it to you in high detail. <laughs> this is her cake, and it shows that in my group, ribosomes are considered sweet. I also want to thank my family. I cannot show all of them, and I cannot talk about all of them. My father died when I was a young child. That is why I had to work so much. But my mother, my sister, my daughter, who is an MD, and granddaughter, they all supported me, although I was not with them all the time. I got a prize in Paris, and my granddaughter gave a speech about me. As you know, she, it means me, is a very busy scientist, but she always finds time for me. I have always admired her work, and because of that, I invited her to, at the age of five <laughs> to my kindergarten to give a lecture on ribosomes. And she gave me a prize. This is not her prize, this is a Nobel medal. But for me, her prize, God, her prize is as important. <laughs> and the prize that she gave me is the grandma of the year is Ada Yonat. So I asked her, which year? <laughs> she said, which year? <laughs> you have to reproof yourself every year, and once you fail, I'll take it off the wall and it's still on the wall. <laughs> so I cannot tell you everything that happened to me, but something really nice. The, it became popular in Israel. This is a carnival. He is me, and this is his wife. You see, she, protein comes out of her. She's a ribosome. <laughs> and even young children became ribosomes. <laughs> and a very, very talented and uh, esteemed by me, uh, an artist and writer, Michel Kishka, made this for me. <laughs> so if you look at it, he is not a scientist. Small subunit, large subunit, small and large, full symmetry. <laughs> and this is where he thinks new antibiotics should be. Thank you.